Good morning, church. I hope you are enjoying uh, what in Indiana we would call Blackberry Winter. In North Carolina, you're kind of a month ahead of Indiana when it comes to weather warming up. But in Indiana in May, when the blackberries are blooming, it would usually get kind of chilly sometimes, and they would call it Blackberry Winter. And guess what? The blackberries are blooming in North Carolina. <laughs> I got to take the grandkids hiking yesterday. We were walking through the woods, and I was helping them identify trees, and we were looking at yellow poplar blossoms, flowers. Anybody seen them? You know what they look like? Yeah. Showing them the poison ivy versus English ivy and why you want to stay away from the poison ivy that was blooming too yesterday. And we saw the blackberries blooming. First ones I'd seen. And so blackberry jelly's coming, okay? Rejoice. Do people need the Lord? Do we need the Lord? Yes, we do. And that's the subject this morning. People need the Lord. Back in the uh, 90s, I got the opportunity to go to China one summer with Adam Kingry. Adam Kingry's mom and dad had been missionaries in China. They were school teachers as well at a consulate in northern China. And uh, Adam got to live in China and go to high school in China, he, and he knew some Chinese. And so I was very happy that my first experience in China was going to be with someone like him, Adam Kingry. Maybe some of you might have known his dad, Jeff Kingry preacher. But when we were there, we were in the city of Shenzhen. At that time, Shenzhen was a city of six and a half million, and the city, which is about the same population as Chicago, was surrounded by a 12-foot electrified fence, and you had to have special papers to get in or out. We got in, and of course I was praying that someday we would be able to get out. <laughs> and we stayed in this Chinese hotel that had several businesses in it and a bank on the bottom floor, but we were up on the 20th floor somewhere, and we would have people come to study the Bible with us. And it kind of made me nervous because there, there was a camera on our door. <laughs> There was also a servant out in the, in the lobby in that, on that floor that would come and bring tea every time a new visitor came knocking on our door. And we were just praying to God, don't let us get caught. <laughs> By the way, you couldn't buy Bibles in China at that time, so we snuck Bibles in too. <laughs> so we're in here studying the Bible with a bunch of people. And this one night we had maybe 20 people and we had two rooms in this, apart, in this uh, hotel room that we were in. And, and, and I was in the, be in the bedroom teaching 10 people. And Adam was in the, in the front room teaching 10 people. And when I was teaching, there was this one guy who was a Chinese businessman. And, 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 he, and, and a lot of them had English names. And he had the English name Moses. And he came to me, he said to me, you know, I'm not a believer in God, but tell me why I should believe in God. And so I started to talk about all kinds of, uh, of evidence for the existence of God. And when I got done, he said, to, he said this to me, you know what? I think my country needs God. Uh, 
I hope that guy has God. I hope he does. Because I'll probably never, ever get to see him again. And I don't have a box of tissues up here. Somebody needs to put one in the pulpit. I tell you what, that's okay, that's okay. God is our reason for being, Paul says. For in him we live and move and exist. As even some of your poets have said. And Paul quoted the Greek poets, for we are his children. Hey, <laughs> all right. We are his children. Paul made those arguments for the existence of God in the 17th chapter of Acts when he was at Athens. Without God, there is no real purpose to life. Without God, personhood is meaningless. That's why we need God. <laughs> Without God, love is meaningless. It's just molecules running around in your head that give you this kind of a feeling, chemical feeling. That's all it is to the secular humanist atheist. <laughs> That's all it can be. Love is meaningless without God. Without God, human rights are relative. That's why the founding fathers in this nation, when they gave the Declaration of Independence, <laughs> When they gave that declaration, they said that these rights were based on a creator. And he gave us these inalienable rights. And people are naturally drawn to God. As much as the secular humanists may hate that, the majority of people are drawn to God. Do we sense a need for God? Psychologists say we do. In fact, they think there might be a God gene in our brains, some, some scientists say. How about that? We need God. Well, but more specifically in this lesson, we need to see that people need the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 4, when Peter and John were told, you quit preaching in the name of Jesus, and, and, and Peter said, that there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Not Buddha, not Muhammad, not Confucius. This is only said of Jesus. It's a bold statement that Christians make that Peter was making. It's a bold statement, but it's a statement that is based on evidence. We need Jesus. Why do we need a Savior? As Paul says in Romans, we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. We don't fall short of our neighbor's behavior. We don't fall short of our spouse's behavior. We fall short of the way God would stay and do things. In Ephesians 2, Paul said that before we were saved, that we were spiritually dead, without God and without hope in the world. That's why we need the Savior. And this morning, I want us to look at Acts chapter 16 specifically and talking about the fact that people need the Lord. Acts chapter 16. The book of Acts tells us about the, the salvation history of the good news of Jesus spreading in the first century, spreading there in the Roman world. In the first chapter of the book of Acts, the, uh, the apostles were given their missionary statement by Jesus Christ himself. He said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest parts of the earth. <laughs> that was their mission statement, to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ because people need the Lord. And so in the 16th chapter, you can read about 
The second missionary journey of the Apostle Paul, who was accompanied by Timothy, with Timothy, by Timothy and uh, Silas, maybe others that were, were not told of, and later Luke meets with, up with him at Troas. But Luke records this second missionary journey's beginning. In the 16th chapter, verse 6, it said that they passed through the Phrygian and Galatian region. These are areas that were located in central Turkey. Having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia, Asia was the west side of Turkey in the first century. It was called Asia Minor, Little Asia. And after they came to Mysia, that was in the northwest part of Turkey, they were trying to go into Bithynia. That's further east, up along the Black Sea. They, they were wanting to go over there in Bithynia. And the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. And passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas. What we're given here in, the, in these verses are, are their travel itinerary. Does anybody watch Rick Stevens besides me? Hey, I see a few guys. I love that show. It's about the time I eat my supper. I sit down and I watch Rick Stevens. And, and I want to tell you, I have saved tons of money. I don't have to go to England, to France, to Germany, all these places. I've already seen them. Hey, I saved tons of money watching Rick Stevens. But here's the itinerary right here of, of these, these Christians going on the missionary journey, okay? And, and notice that they are directed by the Holy Spirit on where they should be going. They don't need maps. They don't need travel books. They don't need a GPS. They got the Holy Spirit. <laughs> How about that? And so they pass through. Phrygia and Galatia, this is just the picture of one of the places they went to in this very chapter of the book of Acts. In chapter 16, they went to places that were located in central Turkey like uh, Derby, in Iconium, and Lystra. And one of those areas, of course, is where they found Timothy and picked up him as being one of their fellow workers. They're traveling through this area. Okay, and that hump of dirt there in that picture is, is Derby <laughs> that needs to be dug up by archaeologists. And they, they went up to the area of Mysia, okay, which is in the northwest Turkey, as I mentioned. And, and one of the big cities up there, most important cities up there, up there was called Pergamon. And these are some of the ruins of Pergamon. And by the way, all these pictures come from uh, BiblePlaces.com. And then they went to Troas, we're told. Now, I, I tell you, I'd like to go to Troas. Wouldn't you like to be sitting there on the beach in the Aegean Sea right there? That beautiful blue, blue sea, isn't that something? But this is where they went. And there's another picture of the ruins that are there at Troas. And when they were at Troas, the Apostle Paul had a vision. He's, he's being given that direction, his GPS by the Holy Spirit as to where he's to go to reach people who are in need. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia, which is what we would call that northern Greece today, northern Greece, a man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. This man in the vision said, what does that word help suggest? How do we say that? I what help? I need help, right? <laughs> People need the Lord. There, there were folks in Macedonia who needed to know about Jesus Christ. They needed the Lord in their lives. And so they begin the journey to go to Macedonia. 
Now, Macedonia, by the way, is in a new continent. They had been in Asia. They had been in the east, in the Orient. And now they're going to be going into Europe taking the gospel into Europe. Now, I'm sure there were Christians already in Europe at this time, in places especially like Rome, because of uh, the gospel spreading from Jerusalem to Rome, as the first two chapters of the book of Acts show us. But they were taking it someplace where people had never heard the gospel. So putting out to sea from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace. Anybody been to Samothrace? <laughs> I knew I wouldn't get any hands on that one. But they made a straight course to it, folks. And on the day following, that means they spent the night at Samothrace. And on the next day, they landed in, in Macedonia. They landed at the coast city of Neapolis. And by the way, when we look at this text, we see the pronoun we in verse 11. That tells us that Luke joined them on this second missionary journey. He joined them at Troas. And so he's sailing with them. And, and, and I want you to notice here, it's an it's insignificant thing, but it's important. They ran a straight course. Luke is using sailing language. He's telling us, we, I was really there. Here's what happened. Here are the details. And that's important, and we'll notice that in a minute. But here's a, here's a neat map. It's, it's not a map. It's actually a picture from NASA, okay, a satellite picture. And, and does anybody know what that is? That's Turkey, right? That's Turkey. And so the Apostle Paul came up here with his fellow workers into the central part of Turkey. And this is called Phrygia and Galatia, going all the way up here. And, and that's where Derby and Iconium and Lystra are located. And, and they go up here and, they, and they're traveling this way. Okay? They're traveling this way. They come up here in this north western part of Turkey called Mysia. It's called the area of Mysia, but it's actually part of Asia Minor. And they want to go over here to Bithynia, but who tells them not to go over there? The Spirit of Jesus tells them, go someplace else. So they come over here and they land at, in their travels at Troas. Yes, and I shake all the time. I got the war shakes right there. I can't hold that still at all. That's where Troas was located, right, right there where that, you see that little, uh, little bitty island off there? Well, it's sort of where I'm pointing at. <laughs> okay, you see that? That's where they were, Troas. And, and, the, and Paul gets this vision, Luke joins them, they get on the ship, and they head northwest, and there's Samothrace. I'd like to go to that island. That'd be a cool place to visit. Samothrace. But see, they made a straight course. Whoa. Because they're going up here, folks, to the city, the seaside city of ne ne Neapolis. Okay? You got the picture of all this travel itinerary? It's just like Rick Stevens, isn't it? Huh? Those of you that don't watch Rick Stevens have no clue of how cool this is. Okay, there's Neapolis. That's where Paul landed. That's where he landed. And, and at Neapolis, it was a good place to land because there was a major highway, the Via Ignitia, which was the main highway across Greece heading to Rome. It's, and it was a highway built by the Romans, so it was a fancy road to travel on. In those days, boy, didn't Paul have a good itinerary? And there's, there is the road that he walked on. That kind of gives me goosebumps just to think about that. Look at that winding around there, going up, a, up on the mountains. 
going up on the mountains. Can you just imagine Paul and his company doing that? And on the way, they're talking to people who need the Lord. They're converting people to Jesus Christ. Just amazing. Just amazing. And from there, from Neapolis, they went to Philippi, which is on that highway via Ignatia, the way Ignatia. And they came to Philippi, which, Luke says, is a leading city of the district of Macedonia, a Roman colony, and we were staying in this city for some days. Luke is an amazing historian. Sir William Ramsey, the famous archaeologist and historian himself, said, that Luke was one of the top-notch historians that we've ever discovered. In fact, Luke was so accurate in the book of Acts and all of his details that it converted, it converted <laughs> Sir William Ramsey to genuine Christianity. Just amazing story there. When we see Luke's writing here, we see details like the straight course of sailing from Troas to Neapolis and stopping at, what was that place? Samothrace? That's a detail, a little bitty detail. You know, for years I wondered, you know, reading in the book of Acts of all these people being converted to Jesus Christ, and you get there in the 28th chapter, and you spend a whole chapter on a shipwreck? What in the world's going on? Here's what's going on. When you read the whole story of that sailing of the Apostle Paul in chapter 28, all the details in that sailing help you to realize that this really happened. This is not fiction. This is not the Iliad and the Odyssey. This is true history. And Luke is, as Sir William Ramsey said, knight that he was, <laughs> this, is, this is fantastic history. Look at the details. Philippi is the leading city of the district. Not the capital, but it is a leading city. And it's in a certain district. There were like four districts. So it was the leading city in its district, Luke is telling us. And it was a Roman colony. It was a special city made up of Roman citizens that was colonized there, okay? And, and, and they were staying in this Roman colony for several days, the text tells us. That's chapter 16. Here's a picture of some of the ruins of Philippi, these ruins here. Now, I want you to notice something here. You see these tall structures here? That was a church building built in the Byzantine time period. And there was more than one church building in town in the Byzantine time period. That was a humongous ch church building. There were lots of Christians there. Paul's work bore fruit into the next centuries where there were Christians there that eventually were wiped out. By Islam. There were church buildings like that built all over Asia Minor, Turkey, all over. Hundreds of church buildings filled with hundreds of Christians at one time. Do you know it's against the law for me to try to convert people publicly in Turkey today? Look at that beautiful farm ground. Around Philippi, there's mountains. You go up in the mountains, and so you, you, you have the city of Philippi down here, but up here you have the upper city called the Acropolis, okay? This is looking out in the valley close to Philippi, and this is a valley where something real famous happened. This is a valley where Mark Anthony and Octavian, who's later named Augustus Caesar, 
fought against Brutus and Cassius. So you Shakespeare folks out there, aren't you excited right now? Was it, I think it's called the Battle of Actium. Is that right? That was fought here. Famous battle that brought on the peace that was experienced in New Testament times that helped to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. But I'm telling you all this because when these soldiers, these Roman soldiers were here, a lot of them decide after this battle, we're going to retire and we're going to start a city. And guess what they called that city? Philippi. Philippi was a Roman colony made up of Roman citizens, a lot of them retired soldiers. How about that? And this is, this is downtown Philippi. Picture yourself there with the Apostle Paul in downtown Philippi. And I don't know if you can see this or not, but there's a little sign there. You know what it says? Via Ignatia. That highway from Neapolis went right through the downtown Philippi. Imagine Paul and Silas walking on this right here. Look at that. And by the way, do you see, do you see this uh, uh, depression in, in, in the uh, stone here from wheels of wagons that traveled over that pathway for centuries? Maybe Paul was in one of those wagons. Isn't that cool? That is so neat. And so we're talking about all this because in Philippi we meet people who need the need the Lord. We meet a very religious Jewish businesswoman <laughs> who doesn't know Jesus. And she becomes the first convert in the Apostle Paul's work there. And ladies, notice, she's, she's a woman. Does Christianity put down women? No, it doesn't. This is one example to prove that that's true. She's a businesswoman, too. <laughs> and she's wealthy, and she has servants, and she's got her own house there. <sighs> she's an impressive lady. And later we read about a slave woman that's owned by some corporation. <laughs> And she has an evil spirit. And that's cast out of her. And I don't know if she ever obeyed the gospel. We're not told all the information about her. But I would likely think that she would have. <laughs> and then later in the chapter, we read about a jailer who's about to kill himself because he's without hope in his life. And all these people needed the Lord. But also we find that Paul and Silas are beaten because of that slave woman's uh, uh, a change of life that takes place. And, 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 and they're thrown in prison. And guess what they're doing in prison? They're crying and weeping and laying on the floor, are they? No. They're praying to God and they're singing to God. <laughs> all the while having their backs bloodied by the policemen in that city. Wow. And all these folks needed the Lord. Well, we're told in the text as it goes on that, that while Paul was there at Philippi, on the Sabbath day we went outside the gate to a riverside where we were supposing that there would be a place of prayer, and we sat down and began speaking to the women who had assembled. Notice it's, it's, it's Saturday, it's the Sabbath day, and there are women out there by the river who are obviously Jewish women who are praying and maybe studying the scriptures. Uh-oh, there we go. Notice it says, it says they went outside the gate to a riverside. Well, on the west side of Philippi, you would go through an arch gate, and right out there was this river, and I can't pronounce it, but you can read it, the name of that river. <laughs> and they are going out there to teach these women about Jesus. 
But I want you again to notice the details that Luke gives us. If he had never been to Philippi, would he know about a gate that went out to a river? Huh? <laughs> notice the details. <laughs> and notice that there, there, there's just women there who are doing this religious activity. Why is that so? Why just women? Because you would not have had Jewish men in a Roman colony, colony, uh, uh, Roman colony city like Philippi. But you could have Roman men who had married Jewish women, and that's exactly what you got going on here. Isn't that interesting? Notice again, the details Luke gives us. There's that river, by the way. And, and it's interesting. If you, if you Google this, you'll find there's a church building there near this river that's named after, guess who? Lydia. How about that? There's a woman, Lydia, there in that group from the city of Thyatira. She's from Thyatira, which was a, a city in, in Turkey, we would say today. It was a city in Asia Minor, okay? So she had traveled from Turkey, from Asia Minor, over to Philippi for business and was living there, had her own house. She was a seller of pur purple fabrics. Guess what they made in Thyatira? Guess what Thyatira was famous for? Purple fabric. Now, the, it was dyed purple from a root that was grown there. How about that? And she was a worshiper of God and was listening, and the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. By Paul. How about that? In the text, we learn that Paul was speaking to the women. And Lydia was listening. Sometimes when we hear people speak, we may not listen real well. I always liked uh, uh, cartoon. A Snoopy. Peanuts, that's what I'm trying to come up with, peanuts. And, 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 and the kids sitting in the class, and what, what, what did the teacher always say? Is that the way you listen to your teacher? Lydia was not that way. She was listening to Paul. She was hearing what he had to say. And the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. Are you that person here this morning where you're really listening to all this evidence I'm presented, presenting to you and you're letting it sink in, you're really thinking about it, or, or are you doing that? Paul's custom whenever he went to a new city or village was to find the Jewish people first because they know all these Old Testament prophecies that lead to Christ, so they can be converted right off the bat. In chapter 17, we learn what Paul spoke to Jewish people whenever he got an audience of Jewish people like these women by the river. We learn what he spoke. Listen to this. Acts 17, verse 3 says that he was reasoning with Jewish people from the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures, explaining and giving evidence, evidence that Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying this Jesus whom I'm proclaiming to you is the Christ so he could go back and he could show that, that this baby was to be born in Bethlehem and this baby would be a son whose name would be Wonderful Counselor, Prince of Peace that's prophesied in Isaiah chapter 50 or, or chapter 9. And then he would talk to them about the prophecy in Isaiah 53 about the one who would die for our sins. He would go to all these Old Testament prophecies and he would show that, wow, they're fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Jesus of Nazareth was the one that was prophesied to come to die for our sins. And Lydia is listening to this. And she said, yeah, this is obvious. And that was opening her heart. And she opened it more. She became a believer. 
because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ, Romans 10, 17. John says, these things were written so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. God intended to use the word as, as the tool that would open people's hearts to his love, to his grace, to the truth of who Jesus is. And obviously when Paul talked to these women, he talked to them about baptism. Because the text goes on and says, and when she and her household, maybe she had children, we're not told that. Maybe she just had servants that helped her in her business. But when she and her household had been baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us, Luke says. you got to come to my house. You've got great things to tell me. I want you in my house. Why were they baptized upon first hearing the gospel right here by this little river by the city of Philippi? Why were they baptized? Because Peter says to people who are lost in sin, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Acts 2.38. <laughs> because Acts 22 verse 16 says, and now, what are you waiting for? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Do you know that baptism is the only sinner's prayer that's mentioned in the Scriptures? It's in baptism that you call upon the Lord to wash your sins away. Acts 22, verse 16. That's why these women were baptized this day, to have their sins washed away to bring them into fellowship with God and to bring hope and joy and purpose to their lives and to see the fulfillment of all those Old Testament prophecies they've been reading for years. And what we learn in this account is that religious people need the Lord. There's a lot of religious people in Concord, North Carolina, that need the Lord. They haven't been baptized. They don't realize that baptism is necessary for salvation. There's thousands of those kind of people all around us in North Carolina. Sometimes good religious people don't know God's word. Sometimes their preachers aren't tell, teaching it to them. Sometimes they're lacking good Bible teaching. Lydia just didn't know. <laughs> She didn't know, but that was changed. So in Philippi, we meet people who need the Lord, a very religious Jewish businesswoman who didn't know Jesus, a slave woman abused by the world, a Roman jailer without hope in his life, and Christians like Paul and Silas experiencing hardship. They all needed the Lord, and some of them found him. Are you here in need of the Lord? Man, I don't know where I'd be without the Lord in my life. He means everything to me. He has brought hope and joy and purpose to what I do. No matter how humble it may be, if you need the Lord, come, I'll be standing safe.